Okay. I get asked this all the time. Can you settle a claim, or in other words, as a shop, can you get paid on an estimate of repair <laughs> with just one email? And and the answer is yes, you can. But there are a few things you have to do to put that in place. So we, we just had one that had a success with that. So I thought I would take the opportunity to just kind of share that with everybody um, so that we can all get an idea for how that works. So um, here is the 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 question that we received from one of our C20 VIP members. So if you are a, a C20 VIP, um, you you get constant coaching. So kind of in the moment, you can email any of the people on our team, whether that's you know Larry, Jason, me, Holly, Melanie, whatever, um, and get help with what's going on. So one of our members wrote in and said um, um, that they had this claims problem. Um, Basically, good afternoon. Please see the email from the insurance company below. We disassembled the vehicle and provided a blueprint to the insurance company on behalf of the customer. This was the response from the insurance company. Um, I want a clever response to send back. And 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 so that's the, the best way to be thinking about it is that we want to respond um, from an intelligence or what I like to call the critical thinking position, not from the emotion, because um, if we respond from emotion, we typically kind of won't get what we want. So this was the email that the adjuster had wrote back to the shop after they had submitted their appraisal of damage. Good afternoon. Once I have the supplement in supplement form, like every other body shop does, I can then proceed. If not, the customer can go through his own carrier if they would like to do business like that and subrogate Donegal. Hmm. Wow, that was that's pretty emotional way to write back to a shop. Um, so I can imagine, you know, getting this and just kind of being furious at, as this is the response. Now we know from a field adjuster's perspective, um, they probably have no idea what they're looking at um, unless they see something in a supplemental form. And that means you've rekeyed something and then you've sent them a document that has little less ones or little less twos on it. Um, it, it, it it's not really a time saver for them. Like I only have to pay attention to the S1s is kind of what they're thinking. Um, but it's more of a, I don't know what I'm really looking at is, is their kind of perspective, but that's your job and that's what you were hired to do. And that's not really what we have to do. So we got to think through this um, from a critical thinking perspective of, of what, what what's really being said here, not the emotion of what I'm reading, what's being said here, but what really is being said. So we know that it's a third party because it basically says if you don't if you don't want to do it the way I want you to do it, then you can just go go have your own carrier pay for the damages and subrogate us. So we know that this is a third party, um, and then we know that with a third party, there there are a lot of duties and obligations that are owed that are somewhat more important. I would like to say than, than the duties that are owed under first party coverages like the collision and comp. So handling handling third party liability, I have a lot more responsibility as an adjuster. Um, in a lot of ways, because there's not, I'm not necessarily just dealing within the confinements of the four walls of the contract at that point. So what we have here, it's it's not a shop issue. Um, it's not a supplement issue. This really comes down to a claims issue and how this particular insurer does or doesn't want to handle their claims. I, I will continually tell you that as a body shop, if you want to be, I think, sane, right? Not as stressed out, not as, you know, like if you want to be remotely sane or find job enjoyment in this industry or success, like your ability to get success, which to us is getting paid, you really must learn and understand claims. Like, like you, I mean, we always tell adjusters though, they don't know anything about cars and car repair. Um, and we think they should. Um, and that same thing kind of applies. You should know claims and claims processing and kind of claims rules and the way that works. It helps you understand what's at play um, a whole lot better than anything else. So liability is clear. It's de definitely been been established because this adjuster is extending the that they will be handling the claim or that it can be subrogated. So we know that we have a clear liability decision here. And when that is the case, the carrier has a duty to act promptly and reasonably. Um, I, I, I can't do anything that delays the handling of this. So this customer bought a policy from me. Um, that says when they're legally liable for damages to another party that they cause, that we're going to step in and handle those damages within the limits of their liability coverage. And if we can't get it settled, then we will pay for the cost of their defense in a court. So I have a lot of duties here. Um, I, I can't run up the bill. I can't stall and delay. 
Um, I, I definitely can't put limits in jeopardy. And sometimes that's a big issue. We, the minimum limits in a lot of these states doesn't even keep up with the cost of a, you know, a 10 year old used car. Um, so so li limits definitely need to be something that I'm always kind of conscious of and worried about. Um, there are some avoidable, unavoidable delays. Those may be investigative delays. Um, and in those cases, there's reservations of rights letters and mitigation letters and things that I need to send to protect the policy's rights and, and protect the consumer as well that, that has hired me. Um, in, in just about every state, the Unfair Claims Practices Act has language that, that says you can't force someone to use their own coverage. When liability is clear, you can't do things or have intimidated practices or use lowball efforts as a way of trying to force the customer to use their own coverage. We, we see a lot of this now in liability where the third the, the third party provider for that for that liability coverages will say we're not paying for rental um and and what it's done is it's a coercion technique the the thought of not having a car and then the cost of having to pay that out of pocket is supposed to make you want to go to your own carrier so that you can have rental coverage um i, I believe it's it's a violation of the unfair claims practices act but it, it's a matter of somebody wanting to assert that i would i think it's stupid to to put somebody to not put somebody in a rental and lose control of that claim, so to speak, and all control over all the physical damage expenses. Um, but DRP has lowered severity and it is what it is. All right. So with, with that in mind, we know we have clear liability. Um, you cannot refuse to pay a claim without a reasonable investigation based upon all of the information that is submitted to you. That, that information doesn't have to be submitted in a certain format. This is a tort loss. So once that information is submitted, you have to do something with it. You can't just say, I don't like it. I don't want to, this doesn't look the way I want. Um, I can't deny it because it doesn't have the little less ones on it. Um, they cannot fail to make a prompt and fair good faith settlement effort. So in other words, I have to take all of the, if, I, if liability is clear and the investigation is over and we're determined liability and I am presented with damages, I have to do everything in my power based on that presentation of damages by the person that has been wronged. So this isn't body shop to insure. This is harmed vehicle owner to the person that has damaged them. So Ms. Smith is, is presenting Mr. Jones with whatever her damages are. Um, I've got to make a good faith effort to make a settlement and do everything in my power. I can't just refuse to do it um, and send them on their merry way. I also cannot compel litigation. So I can't go sue me for it, right? That's that's not taking care of my fiduciary responsibilities. Um, and if I can, and if it ends up driving up the cost of the loss, the overall cost, even though I may say, okay, we're going to pay it, just that mishandling and raising of the cost could be grounds for a bad faith back on the insurance company, the adjuster, et cetera. So I've got a lot of responsibilities and I always tell people those responsibilities always kick up just a little bit when it's a third party claim. So you, you wanna be aware of that. So I got that going in my favor. Um, and then now what do we need to do? Well, if I know what their responsibilities are and I believe what my pressure points or pain points or negotiation points are on this issue, um, I need to first establish this adjuster is just not acting reasonably, right? Um, and that they're encouraging um, expenses to continue to incur and they're encouraging the loss of control of those expenses by telling the customer to go somewhere else. Um, it's a tort claim. And I need everybody to always remember in a tort claim, no one is under the, the third party that has been damaged. The person that has suffered at the result of negligence is under no obligation to deal with an insurance company. There's, there's no legal obligation to deal with the insurance company of the person that hit you. Sure. That's easier. But the legal liability is between that person and the person that hit them. The person that hit them happens to have purchased this coverage that allows someone else to pay for those damages. Our dealing with that insurance company is a courtesy because like this guy says, well, if you don't like it, go through your own carrier or, or you can, Ms. Smith could technically pay for the damages herself and she doesn't have to go through her own carrier. No one has to use insurance if they don't want to. And that claim would still be owed. So we, we basically have, there's no right of inspection by the third party insurer. They can't demand to see the property. They can't do any of that. That that making property available for inspection is a contractual coverage obligation and doesn't apply to the third party. 
Um, I always used to tell my adjusters that person can go off, have the vehicle completely repaired, pay for it completely out of pocket, come back to us and hand us an invoice. And we have to figure out what we have to pay. We may say that we don't owe the whole invoice. We may want to like, you know, work on that, but, but I can't just say no. Right. And I don't have any right. I can't compel them to let me have the property um, and look for it. So everything that we're doing right now as a shop in this claim is a courtesy to that third party insurer. Everything that Ms. Smith or the owner of the vehicle that's been damaged is doing to make that available to that insurer is a courtesy. It is not an obligation and there's no legal you know, right to the property or they have to. If the adjuster refuses to handle the claim, which is basically kind of what they're trying to do right now, they're basically saying, I don't like what you've sent me. I'm not going to do it until you do it the way I like it. And if you don't like that, then you can go somewhere else. So if this adjuster is refusing to handle claim, the, the exact best way to do this right now would be to do whatever you want, pay the bill and send the bill in. Like they, in a way, they've, they've kind of waived their their rights, right? You've You've been the good actor, the good faith actor in this and, and giving them applicate availability to the vehicle. Uh, but you don't you don't have to at that point. So um, I always tell people that's really the best way to handle a third party claim is just go get it fixed, pay the bill and then turn the bill in. Um, but that's hard for a lot of people to do. Closure repair is expensive and most people don't have a lot. So you want to work with them. So now we need to we need to make sure that um we understand adjuster mentality that this is a human to human being decision, right? Um, so a status quo will create a false sense of importance. In other words, because so many shops in the market have catered to and put priority on the dealing with the insurer and accepting and getting payment from the insurer, the, this adjuster feels like that they have authority and control that in their mind, they haven't, they probably don't even realize that there's a big difference between a first party and a third party claim in which, what is an expectation of services and what is not. Um, when that happens um, and, and you've got a lot of claims coming in, people get overwhelmed. And when people feel overwhelmed, then they will, they will express that, that with anger, which is what this guy has done. Um, in his mind, the S1s are a perceived time saver. So I have all of these claims on my docket or whatever that needs to be handled. And you're making my life harder by not giving me the easy um, little less ones for me um, to do. Now, when you put these three things together, in their mind, that makes you difficult. It, it, they don't look at it from, from their perspective of this is my job. I have a job to do. I have a duty to my insurer to protect their financial and legal interests to avoid court, to do whatever. That's the duties. That's the job. That's what the guy signed up for. And, and I think I had hundreds of discussions of this with my adjusters. And there was a time when I was a rookie that a manager had to have this discussion with me and, and call me in the office and sit me down and go, it's not about you, boo-boo. It's about the customer. So put aside whatever conveniences or irritations or whatever you have. And remember that you've got to focus on one, the customer's needs, because you should want to do that. That's customer service. But then two, we have legal obligations that we we cannot, we cannot, you know, sit down on our job and not do it. So the solution. So here's what we asked. We told the shop after we talked through it, went through the critical thinking tree and had them re-envision what was really happening and what that email really meant. So this is what we were told. They were told to wrote back. Good morning. I want to make sure that I am not interpreting your email incorrectly. So in other words, I want to make sure that I understand you and that I am accurately speaking what you want done, that I'm not misinterpreting. I'm not putting words in your mouth. I'm not uh, creating a, a false narrative to the consumer or whatever. I, I am sure we both want to make sure that insert customer name takes the appropriate actions. Is it your position that you are refusing to review the damages customer is presenting. Donegal is waiving inspection and review rights and is instructing Ms. Smith, customer, to personally cover the damages to the vehicle. Now, even if she had elected to go through her own insurance carrier, that's still her personally covering the damages to her vehicle. That's her using a coverage that she has. So I could pay for it out of pocket. I can use it for my own insurance, whatever, but that you're asking her to personally cover the damages. Um, that Donical wishes to handle this as subrogation. And, and I was like, that's it. Don't say any more. Don't add any cuteness. Don't add, you know, I always, sometimes, you know, I write back and say, um, you know, I, I'm sure you're a trained adjuster, obviously with a ton of experience and, and reviewing the differences in the estimate. Um, 
will be easy for you. But if you need my assistance, please let me know. It's kind of setting them up not to send me this email. Um, but but we're not there yet. So we don't want to add any of the snarkiness. We don't want to add any of the things that we really want to say. So we just send that. And then what are the results? Well, in less than 24 hours after sending that email, the shop was paid in full. Um, so we got this email response. This is just tell Kristen, thanks for the email to the insurance. It worked and they paid in full. Um, and then now we got another problem, right? We have to talk about an insurer wanting to abandon a vehicle. And that's um, a pretty common issue these days. And that's part of the total loss class that we have. But yes, you can get paid on single emails if you will use critical thinking to think through it. So negotiation is important. Negotiation classes are important. Negotiation techniques and strategies are important. But if you don't have a critical thinking foundation to know which tools you should select to use in the negotiation or what's the appropriate response in an email and how to move the chess pieces around the board, then, then it, you're just kind of throwing things at a wall and, and eventually sometimes something sticks and you're like, oh my God, that worked. But critical thinking really makes that go a lot faster. And for you to have a foundation for critical thinking, you're going to have to understand claims and, and claims law and claims handling best practices and all of those things because it, it helps you see the other side. And that's really what's critical um, in negotiation. You'll hear some people run around and say empathy is the greatest tool in negotiation. And empathy is a great tool, but to have empathy, you must understand the perspective of the other party. And so if, if you don't understand claims, um, it's about as frustrating as, as a shop telling me that my adjusters don't understand cars, right? Like like there's, there's two sides to every story. So we want to make sure that we've got it. Um, if you have any questions about our VIP program, being able to have in the moment coaching as you're working through repairs, helping you think through processes um, and understand some things, um, we, Melanie, just email Melanie at Collision. Melanie would be happy to talk to you about the program. Um, we're happy to help anytime that we can. Um, in our next video, I'm going to do another one of these next month where we talk about how to handle this abandoned salvage problem and what the response is when an insurer says, I don't want to pay the fees and I'm just going to leave the car with you um, outside of a state protection law that, it, that prevents an insurer from abandoning property. What are some steps you can do? And we'll cover that next month. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week.